Both them. Today I want to tell you about a civil rebellion that happened about 51 years ago. It happened on this day, May 30th, 1969, on a Dutch Caribbean island, Curaçao, part of the Netherlands Antilles. The Netherlands Antilles were a group of post-colonial Caribbean islands who had powers of a state within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, similar to the relationship of Puerto Rico with the United States. The Antilles had been formed 15 years earlier in 1954 prior to the rebellion of 69. The rebellion took place in the twin cities called Punda and Otrabanda. Most commercial buildings within the cities were looted, burnt and destroyed. There were two deaths and 40 million dollars worth of damage. This labor movement was mainly caused by the onset of the Industrial Revolution. After the abolishment of slavery, slaves were slowly replaced by automated machinery and industries. Because of that, what has started as a labor movement quickly morphed into a racial equality movement within a span of just two days. Some of the idealism behind this rebellion was the following introduce labor laws because there weren't any, redistribution of income not wealth, redistribution of government funding for more housing at the cost of less commercial infrastructure, affirmative action based on race discrimination in the workplace, laws regarding immigrant laborers mainly Dutch, U.S. Indian and Latin American labors needed to be legislated. The resignation of the current government and the establishment of a labor oriented government. All of these goals had been achieved. The Netherlands were major players in the Atlantic slave trade. They were not slave users but slave distributors. You could say that they were the Al Capone of the slave trading and Curacao was the main warehouse. Curacao's main source of income and labor provider has been an oil refinery since the 1920s. The oil was mainly supplied by neighboring country Venezuela through Exxon and refined in Curacao by Shell. In 1952, Amador Nita, a writer and activist, wrote a book titled The Social Dreams of the Country-Born Child in the Equally Divided New Kingdom, translated from Dutch. This book reflected the struggles of inequality that the locals were experiencing regarding both labor and racial discrimination. It may have been the initial spark of the demonstration that turned into a rebellion. During that time, the Antilles was in the process of establishing a government. The country was run by a government council led by the appointed president, Dr. Moises da Costa Gomes, from 1951 to 1954. In 1954, the first elections were held. Dr. Moises was defeated and Efrain Jonker became the first official Prime Minister of the Netherlands Antilles. Efrain Jonker served as Prime Minister for 14 years up until a year before the rebellion in 1968. He has to this day the title of the longest serving Prime Minister of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. He was later promoted to Minister Plenipotentiary, while Ciro Domenico Crone took over as Prime Minister in 1968. Smells like a setup? Well, that's subjective. The mastermind behind this demonstration was a high school teacher named Stanley Brown, a revolutionary man who had radical socialistic ideals. 
and then we came back and saw the big differences in the Dutch capitalistic system and the existing one in Curacao. Mm -hmm. And we felt the racism more here than we felt it in Holland. So that influenced the group to organize itself in what became the Vito movement. No? That was a control mechanism um, that, that you could not break through. And I, I, I fought for that. I fought for the break through. No? And that is what happened really in um, 30th of May. Mr. Brown had about 20 bikers who were serving as messengers to the different union leaders since there were no cell phones back then. Wilson Papa Godet was the union leader at the Marine Docks. He was the most vocal and active of all the union leaders. He was the leader of the demonstration and acted accordingly. It all started at the Shell oil refinery when a white supervisor kicked out a black employee from his office. This sparked a solidarity movement that gained momentum. The unionized workers from all sectors including the marine docks decided to strike. The protest quickly escalated when they were met with a poorly equipped small police team whose only weapon of defense was a gun. Papa Godet trying to calm the crowd while standing in front of the police was shot by the police, ironically. What was first a demonstration by employees from all sectors that were unionized degraded to protesting and now rioting. After word got around the island that Papa Godet had been shot, all hell had broken loose. Immigrant laborers were targeted and looted of their material possession. It must be noted that most of them were not injured. Most injury was caused by the police defending property of the kingdom. The city of Punda and Ultrabanda were on fire. The causes for the fires are uncertain. Now, after 40 million US dollars worth of damages, martial law was declared and the Dutch military were patrolling the island. The end result was that laborers would get more rights, African descendants or rather slave descendants were given civil rights within the political and commercial spectrums. It was two birds with one stone. As far as the Antillian civilian, the results were instant. Labor laws were introduced and African slave descendants were recognized socially as equal. As far as the key people involved with the movements, it didn't turn out so well. There's much more to the rebellion of May 30th, 1969. In honor of Dr. Moises da Costa Gomez, who legalized tambu music, which is a genre of music that was originated by the slaves of the Netherlands Antilles and was banned. I will leave you with this sound clip from Musa. Please be.